I am going to uh, try to do two things today. Uh, I want to focus generally on the issue of animal abuse and talk about how it may be embedded in antisocial and other problems in children and adults. But the majority of my presentation is going to be about the role of animal abuse in intimate partner violence, uh, trying to answer a question which every reporter seems to start off their interview with. Why do women stay in abusive relationships? Okay. What, what, is the, what do the pets have to do with it? And what I remind them of is Hurricane Katrina in the United States, cyclones that have hit you here in Australia, bushfires in the Northern Territory, cases where people will sometimes refuse to be rescued unless their animals can come with them. In fact, Hurricane Katrina highlighted this so vividly for, for people with, with uh, Coast Guard helicopters hovering above a roof and a, a woman with an animal, with her pet dog there, saying, the dog has to come too, or I'm not leaving. I'm not leaving him behind. So if we can understand that, I think we can understand how women who are abused may be frightened of leaving their pets behind. Uh, the Katrina situation in the United States actually resulted in federal legislation that now requires emergency services to take the companion animals of people in disaster situations. So uh, all those photos and, and videos on the screen really had an impact uh, in the United States. I wish to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners and original inhabitants of the land on which we meet the Jagara and Tarbul peoples. And uh, in addition to that, I would like to advise any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people in the audience that I will be showing photos uh, of people who have now died. I also need to uh, tip my hat to two individuals who I met in uh, 2006 when I went to Darwin uh, for a, an AMRIC conference, that's Animal Management in Remote and Rural Indigenous uh, Communities. Uh, Phil Donahue, uh, who died tragically in a freak accident uh, behind his home with electrical wires, uh, Phil was a public health official by training, and Phil was the person who really tried to invigorate uh, AMRIC to become an effective organization that was culturally sensitive and culturally competent to try to improve health uh, in indigenous communities that were remote and rural. And in part, they tried to do this by improving the health of dogs in those communities. Uh, dogs can be a significant problem in terms of bites, in terms of transmission of disease, and one cannot go into indigenous communities and say, this is what you need to do. It took Phil months and months and months of interacting with individuals until the point where he was so trusted that I think it's called he was given a skin name by the indigenous community he worked with. Uh, a real honor in terms of being accepted in that community. Uh, Phil and I became fast friends. He had contacted me about coming to the conference about a year beforehand. Uh, we spent many, many hours uh, in our underwear together talking about what I should do for the conference. We were on Skype, so it was above the waist and you know, no problem, no problems there. Uh, but we spent many, many days uh, talking about uh, what the needs were in many of these communities. He sent me books that I could read so I, become, I could become educated uh, about uh, issues in indigenous communities. And so he was extremely helpful. The other person was Allison Hunt. Allison is a traditional landowner uh, in the Alice Springs area. Uh, Allison does not have a social work degree, but Allison is an amazing social worker. She will go into situations where a family is in conflict and machetes are being wielded and she will diffuse that situation. Just a remarkable woman. 
and uh, we two spent time together during the conference. Uh, Phil warned me, you know, sometimes it's very difficult to, uh, you know, gain the trust and have Aboriginal people talk to you uh, unless they know you. And I was really blessed with Allison being quite open with me about problems in her community and uh, some of the needs that she thought uh, had to be addressed before progress could be made. So my hat's off to those two individuals. Uh, I am at the University of Denver as a scholar in residence, and part of the Graduate School of Social Work is the Institute for Human-Animal Connection. Uh, this is one of the very few institutes that is involved, uh, affiliated with a, uh, an academic institution that focuses on human-animal relationships in all their forms. And I would encourage you to go on the internet and look up uh, that uh, site and one of the individuals you will see there is the executive director, Phil Tedeschi, my colleague there. And Phil is a, uh, a social worker by training. Uh, he does forensic evaluations for both children and for uh, adults for the criminal justice system. And uh, Phil is in charge of animal assistance certificates, uh, animal assistance social work certificates that can be obtained at the master's level in this program as well as uh, students who are able to get PhDs uh, with a concentration in animal-related issues. So the University of Denver program is, uh, I was very, very fortunate to be affiliated uh, directly with them for a number of years. Now, well, let's start off with some wonderful positive things, okay? Because we're gonna have to talk about some terrible things and devastating things. Uh, whenever we think of humans and animals, we should be thinking about the vast majority of cases where that relationship is beautiful. Uh, these are children in Nara, Japan, where deer run free throughout the whole city. You know, people drive carefully so they don't hit a deer. Uh, children are brought there for school field trips so they can see all the uh, deer in the community. And they are respected, they're revered, they're cared for well, and they are protected. Uh, in the United States, and I'm pretty sure this is happening here uh, in Australia as well, uh, veterans returning from Iraq, from Afghanistan, uh, sometimes with very serious physical injuries, sometimes with very serious psychological injuries. Uh, people have been looking at the ways that animals can assist in rehabilitation or even just providing companionship for uh, veterans. And uh, many of these programs are in the process of being specifically evaluated uh, now in the U.S., which is very, very important. Uh, many programs may appear to work, but unless we have data demonstrating that they in fact do work, uh, we're hard pressed to uh, promote those programs. Well, I'm also going to talk a little bit about a major change that has occurred in the United States, and that is a collaboration between a federal research agency and an animal welfare organization in the private sector. The National Institute of Child Health and Human Development is part of the NIH, the National Institutes of Health in the United States. That comprises the Cancer Institute, uh, the Institute for Infectious Diseases, which you may have seen in the media recently because of the Ebola crisis uh, in the world. Uh, that organization partnered with the Waltham Foundation. Waltham is a pet health company that is a subsidiary of the <laughs> Mars Corporation. Anyone, does that sound familiar, Mars? What is Mars? M&Ms, Dove Bars, okay? Big, big, very wealthy, very wealthy company. They have a remarkable animal health uh, research laboratory on the grounds of a small town in, uh, in England. They were so environmentally sensitive that they, they built kind of a, a ditch in this big field so that all the buildings wouldn't stick up out in the community. So you drive by and it looks like there's just uh, gardens and, and uh, forest when actually there's a major research center there in Mowbray. And uh, at that facility, for example, they have a sensory garden for animals that are losing their sense of smell. 
where they've planted all these uh, beautifully smelling herbs that the animals can explore. Uh, and they're more intense than they would actually have in a regular environment. Fascinating group. Yeah. But they've partnered, as of 2009, to fund research on human-animal connections. And I'm talking about substantial research funds. So for example, they fund, uh, typically each year, grants in the vicinity of fifty to $75,000. <coughs> and if I look at the current exchange rate, we're pretty close US and Australia right now. Uh, so it was easy to buy your money before I came over here. Uh, that's one example. They also funded, in 2009, four longitudinal, four-year, multi-million dollar grants. This has never happened in the field of animal uh, research before. So this is a, a tremendous change that is occurring in this area. And the grant that I received focused on children who were exposed to domestic violence, to intimate partner violence. So they weren't just funding projects that dealt with just animal welfare, they were open to projects that kind of pushed the margins in terms of uh, human-animal relationships, a, a very nice feature of that program. Now, animal abuse uh, presents a number of problems. Just the term itself presents a number of problems because it can take so many different forms. Uh, Michael, you have Michael Beatty, who is with Queensland RSPA, is here. I told you I would get you involved <laughs> some way. Uh, you have wildlife crime in Queensland. Uh, we have that in the United States. Uh, poachers. That's animal abuse, technically, by our statutes in, in the United States. Uh, individuals who hoard animals. You've heard of that? Do you have those hoarding videos uh, here? Okay. Uh, not too often. It's usually hoarding stuff. But they're individuals who hoard animals. They have more animals than they can properly care for. Okay. If you're Mr. Branson, a virgin, and you want to have 190 animals on your property, he can afford to have them. That's not hoarding. It's when you have more animals than you can properly care for. And so that's a form of animal abuse in the United States as well. Uh, dog fighting, man beating his wife and killing her kittens. All of them qualify as animal abuse. For the purposes of research, a number of years ago, I worked with a couple of graduate students and said, you know, before we do anything else uh, in our work, we've got to sit down and come up with some kind of definition that we hope will be accepted by other researchers. We have to have some uniformity in what we're talking about, some commonality in what we're talking about. So we came up with animal abuse as non-accidental, socially unacceptable behavior that causes pain, suffering, or distress, and or the death of an animal. Now, why socially unacceptable? Well, you have rodeos in Queensland? There's a lot of, you know, controversy, or controversy, right? Controversy, controversy, uh, about uh, rodeos in the United States as well, okay? Uh, males in the audience probably would not like to be hitched up the way some animals are, so that you start bucking. Okay, some people consider that to be quite cruel uh, in treatment of others, of animals. Others say, you know, come on, it's rodeo, they're farm animals, working animals, uh, don't be worried about it. Uh, there are things we do that we accept socially or that a majority of the members of our community often accept, and so we wouldn't want to consider those animal abuse because there are no laws against them. There's no social sanctions against them in many ways. We can't arrest everyone at a rodeo because we think they're harming animals in some way. Uh, I also listed causing pain, suffering, or distress. I didn't say just physical distress because I strongly believe, and I think there's good evidence now, that animals can suffer psychological and emotional distress. Now, another aspect of animal abuse that's tricky is that sometimes we see a behavior, but we're not sure what the motivations are, okay? I don't think the cat and the child have the same motivation in this particular situation. I think uh, we like to anthropomorphize, 
and we know that the cat is licking his chops. Okay? Just hoping that that bowl will fall over. But there are other cases where it's very clear, and when we look at an individual engaging in this behavior, virtually everyone says, my God, that's abusive, that's terrible. I don't know if any of you have been following the, uh, the football fiasco, and I wouldn't just say fiasco, I'll say disaster in the United States, where a football player was caught on videotape, punching his fiance in the face, knocking her down in an elevator, and then dragging her limp body out of the elevator by the top of her dress. And he has now been suspended uh, indefinitely, although originally he was only suspended for two games. Okay. And a few days after this furor came up, his wife was interviewed and she said, why are you doing this to us? Leave us alone. What happens between us is our business. You're ruining my now husband's life. The dynamics of domestic violence. Uh, there was another case in the United States where a football player has been arrested for beating his four-year-old child. And his explanation was that he was disciplining his four-year-old the way he was disciplined when he grew up. Which was his father would pull a branch off a tree outside and would have the child strip naked and he would beat the child on the box. So that's what he did with his four-year-old child to the point where he injured the child's scrotum and the child had open cuts, lacerations on uh, the child's buttocks, okay? That qualifies as child maltreatment in the United States. I think it would qualify as child maltreatment here. A uh, day or two after this story was in the news, a fellow football player on another team said, oh, you know, what is all of this excitement about? I do the same thing with my one-year-old daughter. What would you possibly discipline a one-year-old child for in that fashion? You know, clearly there needs to be strength training, but there needs to be parent education when individuals enter some groups in our society. So very clearly the definition can sometimes be challenging, but in other cases it's clear. In this case, uh, a child in a refugee camp in uh, Thailand uh, about to step on that dog's back as he pins the puppy's uh, back legs. Uh, this is a situation that occurred uh, in an indigenous community. And what I want you to do is to focus on the face of the dam, the mother of the puppies, watching, having to watch, helpless, what is being done to her puppies. Uh, I interpret her look as involving psychological distress. We can debate that, but it looks like she's clearly psychologically distressed by what's happening. And this is something that Frank McMillan, a veterinarian uh, in Utah, uh, talks about in his book on the mental health and well-being of animals. This is a study that was published uh, fairly recently in 2013 on uh, a number of cases of dog bites in the United States. What they found, looking at all the variables in these cases of dog bites, I want you to focus on the last two, was that there was prior mismanagement of the dog by the owner in 37% of the cases, and there was abuse or neglect of the dog in 21% of the cases. So very clearly, we're looking at cases where we tie the animal's behavior to inappropriate treatment of the animal by the human beings who have been entrusted with their care. And we, you know, we can talk about situations where we might look at what happens in cases where children are violent. What are some of the factors in their background that might result in their being violent? Well, I suspect we might come up with characteristics of the environments in which they grow up, characteristics of their family members, characteristics of the way they are being reared or have been reared. So I think we'll see many commonalities between uh, animal and human welfare in these instances. And it's not just individuals who are uneducated, uh, 
who are socioeconomically disadvantaged. Uh, this is a photograph uh, from a video of a chief executive officer of a multi-million dollar corporation who was minding a friend's dog and who was videoed kicking it around in an elevator because, as he said, uh, the dog was frustrating him. Okay? Now, he clearly uh, doesn't need education about how to treat animals. He perhaps needs education about how you appropriately discipline animals and how you appropriately uh, pull away from situations where you're going to lose control of your behavior. But it covers all the spectrum of uh, human beings' social status and economic uh, circumstances. Now, how many of you are in child welfare specifically? Okay. How many of you are in the area of domestic violence, intimate partner violence? How many of you in animal welfare? How many of you are students? How many of you are magistrates? Oh, Dad, you said you'd have at least 12 magistrates. <laughs> uh, how many of you, do you say barristers or lawyers here? Both. Both? Any bar barristers, lawyers? Yes, great, great, okay, excellent. What groups have I missed? Law enforcement, healthcare professionals, nurses, physicians, veterinarians. One veterinarian, two veterinarians, excellent, okay. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the relation between child welfare and uh, animal abuse, and then I'm going to, as I said, move directly into the area of animal abuse and intimate partner violence. 1860, Ambroise Tardieu was the director of the Paris Morgue, okay? He was the director of the Paris Morgue. And uh, he would be the one to do most of the forensic evaluations of bodies that were brought into the Paris morgue. And he had encountered many, many instances where children were the victims. And in 1860, he wrote a paper, A Medical Legal Study of Cruelty and Brutal Treatment Inflicted on Children, where he reported on cases where children had been subject to such levels of abuse that they died from it. And he indicated that in the records, the perpetrators of the abuse were typically individuals the child knew. Mother, father, grandparent, caregiver, uh, another member of the family, a teacher. And he wrote extensively about the types of cases that he encountered. That paper disappeared from the consciousness of the medical community for decades. That paper was only unearthed in the uh, middle of the 20th century. And it was unearthed because doctors in Denver, Colorado, in 1962, published a seminal paper, The Battered Child Syndrome, which indicated that Many children brought to their clinics in Colorado had suffered injuries, sometimes injuries that were fatal, but the injuries were typically inflicted by parents, by caregivers, by moms, by dads, by someone who was in a position of trust with the child. And they began to identify, because the, the paper was one of these first interdisciplinary papers it was uh, authored by a physician and two radiologists and a psychiatrist and you know, people from a variety of different professions. And they began to identify things like spiral fractures, you know, where a child has a fracture in their arm that results from a twisting action. It's not something that happens when a child falls off of a bicycle or falls from a swing. It is only when someone torques the child's arm or some other limb, that you see that particular type of fracture. And that was the beginning of forensic assessments of child maltreatment victims. Uh, now there's assessment for that, there's assessment for sexual abuse, and so forth. 
but that was the beginning of this program. Now, the result of this paper was that in the United States, it, in essence, uh, prompted the creation or the passage of the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, which was the beginning of the child welfare system related to child abuse and neglect in the United States. Now, given the, you know, the flaws in all these systems and challenging work that is being done by these organizations, uh, but very clearly, we still need organizations that will, in fact, monitor the health and welfare of children, and in some cases, intervene. 2001, a veterinary surgeon in Scotland published four papers, also entitled, <coughs> titled Battered, but here, Pets, Battered Pets. And a survey of veterinarians in Scotland indicated that veterinarians do, in fact, encounter cases where animals are brought to their clinic and the animals have non-accidental injuries. Okay? They're non-accidental injuries, which is the term that is used by pediatrician for child maltreatment-related injuries. They're non-accidental. Cases where there was physical abuse, cases where there was sexual abuse of animals, and cases, not very many, but cases where owners of the animals were either creating fictitious accounts of their animal's illness, or in some instances were making their animals ill to get attention from the veterinarian. Munchausen syndrome by proxy with animals as the proxy. So virtually every form of child maltreatment can also occur in animals. And if you think about it, Animals can also be neglected, and animals can be emotionally abused. So we have all forms of abuse common to uh, human beings and to animals. There is a uh, veterinary researcher who just moved from England to uh, Sydney, uh, Lydia Tong, and she has printed a paper that helps veterinarians distinguish accidental from non-accidental injuries in dogs. Uh, that was published in the Veterinary Journal, and an editorial related to that uh, article suggests that this type of research is a step in the right direction in terms of helping to identify cases where animals have been abused and where human beings may also be at risk. Well, I was supposed to use my notes. Okay. Anyway, uh, now, bestiality, people who have sexual interactions with animals, a topic we don't like to talk about, but we need to be aware of it. Uh, again, a paper published by Helen Monroe, the uh, veterinary surgeon, uh, and a case study in uh, a, another country looking at an animal that had been terribly abused. There were two other papers, one published in the Veterinary Journal about sexual abuse of a female sheep, and then Journal of Forensic and Legal Medicine, not an animal welfare journal, severe anal injury in an adolescent male, a human adolescent male, due to bestial sexual experimentation. When this child was first being examined, and they looked at the child's injury, they were about to call child welfare, and they were about to launch investigations of family members in this adolescent boy's family. As it turned out, after they continued to question him, and some of the aspects of his relating of what happened didn't seem to match all the time, the young man finally admitted that he had enticed the dog to penetrate him, and that's how he got injured. No one was abusing him. Uh, he was just experimenting on his own. So you can imagine what would have happened if he hadn't fessed up to that. You know, uh, it would have been one of those cases where there was a false accusation, and even though it was false, uh, people's lives were destroyed simply because the accusation had been made. So very clearly uh, a topic that's unsavory, but one that can be very, very important to address. Uh, 
Another study relating to individuals who abuse children sexually and individuals who rape adults is one that was conducted uh, by uh, Dominique Simons and colleagues at the Department of Corrections in Colorado. They had a sample of men, in, all these men were incarcerated, uh, one part of the sample were men whose major offending style was to engage in sexual abuse of children. Now they had other offenses as well, but that was their major offending style. The other group were a group of men who had raping adult women as their major offending style, even though they had other crimes that they engaged in as well. So we have two groups of individuals, and they looked at three things, uh, self-reports of child abuse when they were children, of uh, animal abuse when they were children, self-reports of bestiality when they were children or adolescents, and whether or not they had been exposed to domestic violence. And again, the reports in the study are quite interesting. Notice, the child sexual abusers are more likely to have engaged in bestiality than the adult rapists. The adult rapists are more likely to have engaged in cruelty to animals than in child sexual abuse. And the adult rapists were more likely to be exposed, to have been exposed to parental violence. So these kinds of studies now are beginning to ask more differentiated questions about when what might we see animal abuse emerging in the lives of individuals. Conduct disorder. Uh, you, there are social workers in this room, right? Besides Deb, right? Okay. Uh, Conduct disorder from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Uh, 15 symptoms. It's a diagnosis given to children, a child or adolescent. They have, the child has to have three or more symptoms in the past six months. Okay. Cruelty to animals is one of the symptoms. Now, what does cruelty to animals mean? Ah, again, we get back to the definition. Because when we query parents or query others about have you been cruel to animals, we never tell them what we mean by cruelty. I asked one mother when we were doing initial interviews uh, looking at an assessment scale uh, of a boy who had been uh, found to uh, be trapping animals in the wild, including cats and other stray animals with a leg hole trap. He and his boyfriend would go out looking for the animals they had trapped, and when they would find them, they would shoot them with a bow and arrow. And they videotaped what they did so they could watch it over and over and over again. Okay? I asked the mother of one of the boys if her son uh, had ever been kind to animals. And she said, oh, yeah, yeah. He loves horses. Uh, he goes down and he actually volunteers at a, at a paddock down the way. And, and uh, he just loves horses. In fact, he once told me he couldn't understand how children could throw rocks at horses. How cruel that was. Her son said this. Then when I asked her, can you tell me when your son was cruel to animals? No. I asked her for another example of when he was kind. And she said, oh, yeah, another thing I remember is that one time he found uh, a cat. And the cat had been shot with an arrow. And it was pregnant. So he cut it open and brought the kittens home and took care of them for a couple of days. That was her example of her son being kind to animals. So we have to be careful about how we uh, interview individuals and understand in context what they may be saying to us. Now in this study, they used that terrible question, you know, in your entire life, did you ever, were you ever cruel to an animal? You know, I would have to say yes to that. You know, I threw a rock at a squirrel once in Central Park. I didn't think I would hit it. I hit it, and I thought, God, that was probably the last time I threw rocks at animals, okay? Uh, we used to catch sharks when we went fishing. Didn't always throw them back in the water. You know, that was cruel. You know, there are, there are things we do when we're children and adolescents that uh, we regret having engaged in. Now, in this sample, they asked that question, and the sample size in this study was 41,000 people, okay? Kind of a nice sample size. We, do, we have people like that in our research, right, Deb? 41,000 participants? No. Four participants sometimes, but uh, 
They divided the group into three. No conduct disorder, none of those antisocial behaviors. Conduct disorder and then antisocial personality disorder. Antisocial personality disorder is a diagnosis given to adults only, but it's only given if they have had conduct disorder earlier in their life. Okay, so it pre presupposes the presence of conduct disorder. They looked at the answers to this question, and as you can see, uh, there's an elevated, elevated rate of cruelty to animals for the conduct disorder group, and even higher for the antisocial personality disorder group, especially for males. Now, the percentages are not as clear for females, but be aware that in the general population, that 5.5 to 2.2 percent, let's average it out to 3.5 percent, that's typically what you might find in a sample of community members if you ask that same question. So 18%, 22%, those are significantly higher numbers. Now, man accused of holding woman captive and brutally slaying 29 dogs in front of her on purpose with a chainsaw. Man beat dog after girlfriend problems. Birmingham lawyer charged with slicing dog's throat and texting picture to estranged wife is in custody. Woman faces battery charge after tossing cat out the window and stabbing a man. I found this uh, this morning. Task force gravely worried about severity of domestic violence in Queensland. Okay. Uh, I could pull out a headline like that in the US, in Italy, the Netherlands, Canada. This is not restricted to any particular culture, any particular uh, country. William Hogarth, the uh, famous British artist in uh, the 1700s, created a series of etchings he called the Stages of Cruelty. Hogarth would often use his artwork as a way of making social commentary. And uh, what he did was he depicted children uh, on a street in London engaging in a variety of horrific behaviors toward animals. The main character in the series of etchings is Tom Nero, the young boy in the middle who is uh, attempting to sodomize the dog. Uh, there's a child to the right of him who is trying to prevent him from doing that. And I believe that other child is a future social worker. Okay? <laughs> trying to intervene in that instance. Uh, Tom Nero is wearing clothing, this little patch on his arm, that indicates that he lives in an almshouse, a place for disenfranchised, poor individuals. Another in the series of the Stages of Cruelty is the third in which Tom Nero is now an adult and he has been arrested for slitting the throat of his pregnant girlfriend. Ah, okay, 1750s, we have an understanding of that relation between animal abuse and intimate partner violence. There is a wonderful story that is contained in this anthology, uh, Women in the Trees. Anyone read that as part of feminist, uh, of course in feminist history? <coughs> okay, uh, I would recommend that you find either that book or even go online and just type in A Jury of Her Peers because it has been uh, made into a play and you can find the, the text of the story. All I will tell you, so I won't you know, give everything away, is that it involves a woman who is in jail. The police are at her farmhouse where she lived and they are trying to figure out why her husband is upstairs in bed having been strangled with a rope. Two women are asked to come over from a neighboring farm to gather some of her things, including her knitting items. <coughs> and they begin to discuss from their perspective what the life of this woman was like and what might have motivated her to kill her husband. The guys are upstairs 
trying to do the legal figuring out of what may have happened. But the other piece that I'll tell you is as they're going through her knitting, they notice a, a bad smell. And in the knitting, wrapped up in a cloth, they find the woman's pet bird, its neck having been snapped. So I'll, I'll leave you to find that story yourself. But I think it's a very, very important uh, early example, you know, 1917, of understanding how animal abuse may be implicated in intimate partner violence. As I began to educate myself on the issue of domestic violence, and I'll tell you why I did that, uh, I was very interested in children's abuse of animals and trying to figure out where that might come from. And we had done a qualitative study where we discovered that children who engaged in animal abuse often came from family environments where there was <coughs> violence present. Uh, extreme corporal punishment, intimate partner violence, uh, serious drug abuse, and so forth. And so because animal abuse is, thankfully, it's a low frequency behavior, I needed to go to a place where we might see more cases of it. And so I decided, let me start researching the area of domestic violence. So I went to our local shelter, um, directors uh, I knew very well, and asked them if they would administer, after getting institutional review board permission, uh, asked them if they would administer to women coming into the shelter a very brief questionnaire, first of all asking, do you have pets? Because I could find no information about whether pet ownership among women who were battered was similar to or different from pet ownership in the general community. And then secondly, we asked them whether their pets had ever been threatened, whether their pets had ever been actually hurt or killed, and whether concern over their pet's welfare had kept them from going to the shelter sooner than they did. Well, it turned out that about 70% of the women said they had pets, which is very similar to what you might find in the general community. Uh, when we asked them about hurting or killing of animals, I was startled by the percentage. And I thought, you know, this probably is related to the fact that it's only 38 women, it's a small sample, it's a very unstable number, don't make too much of it. But another question about whether or not they were concerned about their pet's welfare, about a quarter of the women, quarter of the women said yes. I delayed going to the shelter. In some studies, for months, I delayed for months going to the shelter because I didn't know what to do with my animals and I was worried about leaving them behind. So we were able to get funding to do a larger study. Uh, in this study, half of the women were victims of intimate partner violence and half of them said that they had not experienced violence in their adult relationships. There were 100 women in shelters and 100 women from the community. Uh, who reported no violence. We asked them similar questions. And I'll just focus on one of the questions. Uh, for the women who were not victims of abuse, 5% said yes to whether their animals had been hurt or killed. For the women in the shelters, 54% said yes. This study was replicated in Australia and Melbourne. Uh, it included women at shelters, but also women who were receiving services but who had not gone to a shelter. Uh, Anne Vallant and uh, Judy Johnson uh, and Eleanor Galoni were the main authors of this particular study. And the percentages they found, 23% yes to hurting or killing of animals for the victims of violence, 0% to the individuals who had not reported any violence in their adult relationships. Remarkable similarity and the results of the two studies. Now, some people said to me when I presented research like this, well, you know, uh, battered women, they can make up stories and you know, they can make things sound worse than they really are. Uh, well, you know, we have no way of checking. Uh, so what we did was we received funding to do a study uh, in the Utah State Prison. And it was a sex offender unit. Uh, who participated in this study, all volunteers. But we asked them, did you, in your adult relationships before you came to prison, ever hurt or kill your partner's pets? 55.3% said yes. Okay. 
So the voices of the victims and the voices of the perpetrators produce very, very similar number, numbers uh, in these studies. Uh, this is a study that looked at women who were court referred to a batter intervention program because there are cases where women are the principal aggressor. And uh, in this particular study, they found that uh, women who had reported uh, much le higher levels of head abuse uh, than the women who were not in a program like that. So not to the same extent as male perpetrators, but clearly it can occur with women as perpetrators as well. And then another study with a large sample of over 1,200 women uh, asked them about a variety of coercive techniques that their partner may have used, and they found that women who reported animal abuse were more likely to report being victims of sexual violence, marital rape, emotional violence, and stalking. So we're seeing this variable differentiating even within a group that is uh, a, vic a survivor of violence. I wrote a paper a number of years ago, and by the way, I should have told you this in the beginning, uh, sorry Deb, uh, all of these slides, which are a subset of the presentations that I gave in Darwin uh, about a week ago, will be on the AMRIC website, and so if you want to pull up the references and uh, look at the data again, uh, just go to the AMRIC website within the next month probably, and I think they will have all the PowerPoint presentations uh, up on their website, and you're free to uh, examine those and use them however you see fit for appropriate purposes, with citations. Okay. And this is a study, uh, there's this D. Walsh, and I'm still trying to meet this D. Walsh who conducted this study, but a uh, very important study because it begins to ask about, do women who are victims of abuse and they bring their animal to a clinic, but, and by the way, parents who abuse their children, take them to the doctor. They take them to a hospital. This idea that, well, you know, if you have, manda you know, if you have mandated reporting, you're not going to see these people in your clinics. You won't see them in physicians. They won't go to physicians. That's not true. People who have pets who have been abused will take them to a veterinarian. Do women talk about their circumstances with veterinarians? Well, this study suggests that you know, women are not sure that veterinarians are, are ready to handle this information. And this is an issue that I think needs to be researched further in terms of providing the best kinds of services to both human and animal survivors. There's also the issue of children who are exposed to domestic violence. And in our study, uh, this was a study in Canada finding that children who were exposed to domestic violence were uh, much more likely to engage in animal abuse themselves than children who were not exposed to domestic violence. In the study in Utah that I mentioned, 100 women who were survivors, 100 women who were not abused, 67% of the children we interviewed said that they had, been, they had seen or heard the pet abuse that occurred in their home. 51% they said they had protected one of their pets or tried to save their pet from being hurt. Good news, bad news means the children still have empathy. The bad news is that children are endangering themselves by trying to intervene, just as they sometimes endanger themselves if they try to protect their moms from being hurt. So again, another area where we see the need for child welfare and human welfare and animal welfare to engage in collaborative responses to these kinds of circumstances. One of the great changes that has occurred is that mainstream research on intimate partner violence is beginning to include questions about animal abuse. So Jeff Elson, who is probably one of the leading intimate partner violence uh, experts in the world, has recently developed a scale to better assess the nature of children's exposure to violence. And one of the items on his scale is how often has your mom's partner hurt or tried to hurt a pet in your home on purpose? And not only does it ask that question in terms of yes or no, it also asks how did you know about it? Were you there when it happened? Did you hear it from another room but not see it? Did you see an injury on 
uh, the animal the next day, but not actually witness when the animal was abused. So very clearly, we're getting more detailed information about the nature of these experiences. And uh, I'm going to go through the next set of slides very, very quickly because, as I said, you can access all of this uh, on the internet once Amrick has these presentations uh, online. This is a study in New Brunswick, Canada, about firearms, family violence, and animal abuse in rural communities, where it's not just companion animals, but sometimes farm animals who are threatened by an abuser. And many of these women uh, judged that the animals that had been killed were killed with a firearm. So there's the interest in the issue of firearms. I've given you contact information for this group as well. Uh, this is a report from uh, Alberta, Canada, uh, similar kinds of issues. Uh, we received this grant I mentioned to you uh, where we are still in the process of analyzing data, but we have 300 women who are victims or survivors of intimate partner violence. Uh, all of them had pets in the past year, and all of them had a child within the seven year to 12 year old age range. Uh, the moms were part of a study uh, in which we were looking at children exposed to domestic violence and exposed to animal abuse in the home. Uh, we had informed consent. We had informed consent from the moms. We had the moms give permission for us to ask their child whether their child wanted to participate. And we had child assent forms, which allowed us to ask the child whether they wanted to participate as well. And this was tricky because we were paying the moms $75 the first year, $100 the second year, and $125 the third year. What we were worried about is uh, we had to separate the moms and children when we asked them about whether they were interested in participating because all we could imagine was the mom says, yes, I'm happy to be involved. Two hours of questions, that's not a problem. Is that in cash, the $75? Yes, okay. Uh, and then the child is asked, and the child says, I don't want to do that. And then going back to the mom, and the mom saying, what? They were going to give us 75 You go back in there right now, and you say, we couldn't have any coercion. So what we decided was, as soon as the child says no, that couple, that dyad, cannot participate, regardless. You know, of whether the child changes their, mind, their own mind or not. Uh, we also were able to get certificates of confidentiality, which means that any information we gathered in the course of the research could not be subpoenaed by anyone. Okay, Another piece of protection for the moms involved. And we at the University of Denver never knew the identity of the participants because all of the record, including the signed consent forms, were kept at the domestic violence agencies. So all we received were code numbers. We never knew who these participants were. And we did this at the agencies because we judged it was safer for the moms and children. And we also did it because, you know, all we could think of is, you know, GSSW gets $1.5 million grant to study domestic violence and children. And then all of a sudden, there are these women and 7 to 12 year olds who are showing up on campus all the time. It's like, wear a big sign on your shirt. Okay, so anyway, things to think about as part of the study. Uh, I've given you contact information about this study. One thing I do want to mention is that over half of our sample are Hispanic or Latina survivors. Uh, we are probably going to have one of the largest samples. Ten minutes, great. We're going to probably have one of the largest samples of individuals who are uh, not in a dominant racial group in this particular study. So these data will be very, very valuable as well. Uh, preliminary analyses, 31% of the moms report pets being threatened, 20%, 27% the animals uh, harmed or killed. Uh, I suspect it's a little bit lower than the, well, it's lower than the 50% we found earlier uh, because I suspect that uh, the dynamics of keeping pets and animal abuse in Hispanic Latina families may be different than what we would see in non-Hispanic, non-Latina families. I don't know. We haven't teased that part out yet. 
Uh, the children report seeing or hearing animals being harmed. A uh, couple of uh, quotes. Anytime my dad is mad, he goes to where the birds are and gets it with his hands and throws it on the floor or against the wall. When I see my dad mad, I will put the birds in a box under my bed so that if he throws the cage, they're not in there. Okay, another example from our early research of a child trying to protect their pet. Mothers. Every time he's mad, he threatens to pluck the bird's feathers off. One occasion, because I would not give him the grocery receipt, he went to grab the bird and was plucking feathers one by one until I gave him the receipt. With a colleague in social work, uh, Terry Peake, who is the director of our social work program at Utah State University, where I uh, used to be, uh, we have uh, conducted a study in conjunction with Adult Protective Services in Utah to see if we can come up with ways of assessing animal welfare issues in the context of elder adult abuse and neglect. There are no protocols that uh, are used by, animal, uh, by adult uh, protective services that include information about pets, except maybe one question uh, related to, uh, have you ever fed your pet the meals that were brought to your home for you? And many women will often say yes to that, not realizing that they can get food from the food bank for their animals as well as food for themselves. There is a national link coalition which provides a great deal of resources that I would recommend to you. Uh, I'm gonna skip that one. This is a program in Perth that is trying to provide interventions for children who have engaged in animal abuse. We don't have any outcome data yet, but this is a program focused on increasing empathy in these children. There are books available. Uh, these are some of my books. Uh, especially excited about the International Handbook of Animal Abuse and Cruelty. Uh, not only is this a great resource for researchers, but if you have trouble getting your child to sleep, uh, <laughs> reading chapters of this book to your child in a very low voice can be very effective, better than Ambien or other sleep aids. Okay, uh, the middle book, Eleanor Galoni, uh, who is, uh, used to be at the University of, uh, at Monash, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention is now providing training to individuals in law enforcement about, <clears throat> about this issue. There are books on veterinary forensic medicine. This was not true 10 and 15 years ago. Uh, animal Abuse and Child Maltreatment, a study in England, uh, collaboration between Child Welfare and, and uh, Animal Welfare, RSPCA, in England, looking at uh, the overlap. Uh, a study examining the potential for animal welfare to be trained in identifying child maltreatment and child maltreatment investigators trained in identifying animal maltreatment and cross-reporting when that occurs. Uh, essentially doubling the number of eyes that are out there uh, trying to look for animal welfare and child welfare. This is from New Zealand, another interagency agreement, uh, one from Canada, and then I will end with a discussion of the issue of pet shelter. In the study we did in Utah, the 100 women and 100 women who were not victims, we found that about a quarter of them said that they uh, did not go to the shelter sooner because they were concerned about the welfare of their animals. A very similar percentage was found in the Australian study. Uh, as a result of that, I decided I would interview 20 animal welfare organizations and 20 domestic violence agencies about programs that they were running that sheltered pets for survivors of domestic violence. Okay? I developed a 144 question questionnaire that I uh, administered over the phone to the saintly individuals who agreed to participate in the study. Uh, when I was finished, uh, I put it into a book form, booklet form, and was getting ready to distribute it. The grant that I wrote called for me to print 200 copies. Uh, as the study went on, people would say, oh, by the way, you know, you've got our interview information. Let us give you the forms that we use. <coughs> so I had like 30 sets of forms that people said, you can distribute these to anybody who wants to use them. And I thought, you know, why should everybody reinvent the wheel? Why not share this information? So I put that in there. 
Well, when you write the grant, you have to figure out how much is the book going to weigh, and what is the postage going to be, and what size envelope do you need? So, it was heavier, wouldn't fit in the envelope, and the postage was more. So I called up the uh, funding agency and I said, got a problem, I need a little bit more money. And I told them why, and they said, no, absolutely not. Uh, instead of printing 200, we want you to print 2,000 copies. We'll give you the extra money for the postage, the extra money for the envelopes, and we want you to distribute it at no cost to every domestic violence agency listed in the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence and bona fide animal welfare organizations in the United States. And if anybody in child welfare wants a copy, anybody in animal welfare wants a copy, law enforcement, prosecutors, judges, send them a copy as well. And if you need more money, let me know. Unbelievable. That has never happened to me where an agency gives you more money than you asked for. So. Uh, just wonderful things have happened. Uh, Allie Phillips, who is a lawyer, developed a safe tea program. This is a program that helps domestic violence agencies think about the possibility of sheltering pets at their location. Maybe with uh, portable kennels, something where they can use a spare room, maybe the laundry room where animals can be kept, at least temporarily in an emergency situation. Uh, this happened as a result of the conference in Queensland. Uh, Jeff Irwin, who is on the board of AMRIC, after I gave this presentation, came up to me and said, here's my card. When you give the talk in Brisbane, you tell them that in uh, Gold City, Gold Coast, right? in Gold Coast, if there is any animal welfare agency that has been concerned about not being able to take women's pets because that's against our ordinance, you have them call me, and we will waive that for them. So if you are in that area, or if you're in a neighboring locale, and want to shame your locale into doing the same thing, say, Jeff is doing this over in uh, Gold Coast. Why can't we do this in <coughs> somewhere there along this beautiful stretch of land? Uh, his phone number is there. Uh, if you go on the website for uh, the city of Gold Coast, you can find the animal management contact information. This is the uh, Lexus. Somebody said I should say this is the Holden of animal sheltering. Is that true? Holden is like your fanciest car? <laughs> no, they were teasing me, weren't they? Mocking the American who came over here. Uh, Stacy Colombo, very wealthy businesswoman in Las Vegas. Very, very wealthy. Uh, she was very upset that animals had to be separated from their, that women had to be separated from their pets. Children had to be separated from their pets if they went to an animal, uh, to a domestic violence shelter. She engaged in fundraising. She raised over $2 million in coordination with uh, the Shade Tree Domestic Violence Program. And with that $2 million, they built Noah's Animal House on the property of the Domestic Violence Program in a secure location that has a perimeter that is uh, secured so that all the women and children have to do is to walk from this building which shelters the people right next door to this building and they can visit their pets anytime they want to while they're at the Domestic Violence Shelter. Now, obviously, not everyone can uh, build a program like that, but when I was doing a <coughs> survey to write the Safe Havens book, uh, creative ways of doing it. In one case, an Eagle Scout group helped build a dog <coughs> lab next to the domestic violence shelter at no cost to the shelter. So uh, the materials were donated by like a Home Depot or a Lowe's or some local uh, home construction uh, company and they were able to have at least temporary housing for animals uh, in that situation. This is a program in Perth that does uh, something very similar, and this is Ontario Veterinary Medical Association that promotes this type of activity, and one, again, major advance in the United States is that uh, every few years, the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence will survey all of the domestic violence agencies in the country that are part of their organization. And they have a questionnaire. 
And as a result of the responses to that questionnaire, they publish a directory. I don't know if they physically publish one anymore, probably not, it's probably online, but they publish a directory of every domestic violence agency that is part of that uh, coalition. And after badgering and badgering and badgering them, we said, why don't you please ask, as part of your questionnaire, do you have a pet sheltering program? They finally did. So now, from now on, we will have a way of telling how many of these programs are there in the United States? Where are they? And the reason the where are they issue is important is, let's say, and this may not be as true in Australia, but I suspect it can happen as well. What if a survivor of domestic violence is moving from one location to another location? Moving from state to state, for example, in the United States, or here from state to a territory to another state. Uh, can we provide them with information about, well, there's another program that can keep your pets if you're worried about that when you make your move, or if you need help sheltering them temporarily while you're making the move. That, I think, is going to be very, very valuable uh, for both animal welfare and domestic violence programs. Uh, this is occurring in New York City. Uh, Oprah Magazine and People Magazine highlighted these kinds of programs. Uh, in the Latino community, there was a story about this recently on our equivalent of your ABC uh, radio. And then the final point I'll make relates to legislative change. In 2006, Susan Walsh, no relation, uh, was able to get a piece of legislation passed in the state of Maine in the United States, which allows judges to include pets in orders of protection. Okay, that was the first state in the United States to do that. Now, there are 26 states in the United States that have similar legislation. And so what this allows a judge to do is say, you have to stay away from your wife, you have to stay away from your kids, you can't touch your things, can't touch your property, can't go near her within a certain distance, and you can't hurt the pets either or threaten them. Because if you violate that, it can be a criminal offense. Now my understanding, and this is true in the United States at least, my understanding is judges in the United States could have done this anyway. Judges can put whatever they want in a protection order. They can say you need to stand on your head. For, you know, judges have a lot of power to do that kind of stuff. Uh, at least in the Northern Territory, someone contacted a lawyer friend of theirs and said, yeah, magistrates can do this too. They can put that in if they want to. But the fact that we have legislation in the United States means that it formalizes it, it makes it much more significant than judge by judge, magistrate by magistrate uh, implementation. Uh, the right hand part of that slide indicates that there is going to be federal law pending in the United States that will include pets and orders of protection. So it doesn't have to be a state by state issue. We'll see what happens with that. So, uh, and new program in uh, Broken Hill, that's in New South Wales, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, this should be familiar to some folks. And there's mention of the protective order there, but it doesn't include pets. So what would have happened if you had put pets in there, I wonder? SPCA in New Zealand is providing a study of that overlap. This is Ohio in the United States. Uh, differences in the ways that abusers may engage in relations with animals depending upon whether a woman is highly attached to her pets or not so much attached to the pets. You know, not rocket science, but Abusers are more likely to engage in threats and, and uh, pet abuse in cases where the woman is strongly attached to the animal. So, uh, again, differentiating even among women with pets who are survivors, differences in how their pets may be treated. Uh, Diane Fallingstad, big name, Deb in the area of domestic violence, I mean, big, big name in the area of domestic violence. She just developed a, uh, a scale on psychological abuse and she has listed harmed pets as a way of intimidating a woman under the category of severe sadistic behavior. 
you know, if this instrument starts to get used more widely, we're going to have more information about the context of that particular behavior. Uh, again, when you go to the uh, uh, PowerPoints, if you download them from the AMRIC website, you'll find a lot of materials. Uh, Utah State University has materials. Uh, there's an article written by uh, Mark Lawry and Catherine Tiplady about the issue of mandatory reporting of animal abuse, because that's a very tricky issue. It's a challenging issue. I don't pretend to have the answers. Uh, it is mandatory in Colorado for veterinarians to report suspected animal abuse. They're uh, not held liable in any way if they make a good faith report. Uh, but they also provided a great deal of training and materials before they implemented that law. We can't just say you should start doing something without having in place what happens if you make that report. That's the worst thing that can happen is that we mess up on that and we tell people to report and there's no structure for dealing with those reports. Uh, this is the Australian Veterinary Association's policy which recommends reporting, not mandates it, and in the United States, the same thing. Uh, it's not mandated. There are some states where it is actually mandated that veterinarians report suspected child maltreatment, but not su report suspected animal abuse. It would be like pediatricians mm -hmm. being required to report pet abuse, but not child maltreatment. Very, very strange. So, I thank you for your attention. I went over by 10 minutes, and I know many of you have to leave to go somewhere else. It was a delight being with you. Uh, my contact information should be, be available through the organizations here today. And if you have questions, I am delighted for those of you who would like to, to stick around for a while. But let's at least uh, take a break so that those who need to leave can uh, be off to their other activities. Thank you so much again. Yes. Yes. Yes, Frank, you only barely touched on farm animals. And um, I've had some instances with us where um, the woman's horses have been horribly abused. Um, and, and another case where um, he regularly comes back into the farm where she still is and, and does things to cattle. Um, so that's not just abuse, that's also financial abuse because it's affecting yes. um, something that's owned for financial reasons. That's right. That's right, um, it is. And uh, uh, the Broken Hill article that I put up, I think was mainly about allowing women to, s women to stay, programs that help women stay on their own property or their own living arrangements and requiring the abuser to, to leave. And I think that's where the protective orders can help, but we all know protective orders are not bulletproof vests. And so unless there's a way of really doing good monitoring enforcement, if there's a full cooperation with the survivor with those protective orders, they can not be very effective at all. So uh, I think it's a way of helping out, especially in cases of farm animals, but I know that some farmers who are neighbors have done pro bono caring for the animals while mm -hmm. a woman has had to go to a shelter. Mm -hmm. And there are some large animal vets who also uh, provide that kind of uh, mm -hmm. care and monitoring. Mm -hmm. uh, during the interim. So mm -hmm. I think we just need to figure out creative ways for us to help each other out mm -hmm. in those circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes? Hi, um, I'm, I'm from Melbourne, so I've come up to hear you talk. Um, part of my role there is to train up local laws officials who um, go and respond to animal abuse and for animal management. Um, so we train them up in what we've got in Victoria as a common risk assessment framework, which includes threats to harm or harm with pets lunch, um, as linked to her likelihood of injury or death. Um, so local laws in our area are all being trained, trained up on it. Have you had any experience with councils or animal management? Yes, my, my best advice for you is that this should be an issue like, as they say in the United States, mothers and apple pie. You know, it should be something everyone says, of course we should be doing this. I think that the group to involve in your deliberations and your planning are individuals who are involved in the farming community, the agricultural community. Oh, we're in the city of Melbourne, so yes. we would be on the top of them. <laughs> not, not for me, personally, but... 
No, but I mean representatives to be involved in your uh, planning and publicity process because if you can get farmers, you know, often when these issues come up, you'll get resistance from agriculture saying, oh wait, are you trying to interfere with our activities? And I think if you enlist their aid right from the beginning and have them realize this is not an anti-farm, this is not an anti-agriculture. We're talking about issues where animals are purposefully harmed. You don't do that on your farm. You know, you want your animals to be well cared for. So they will often raise a voice of opposition to changes in animal welfare laws. And uh, unless I'm misinterpreting your question. I think slightly, okay. yeah. So, because yeah. they're I, really see, I can see it on your face. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Like, they're really on board. took me seven minutes. <laughs> they come to us and pay us to come and talk to them. So they're changing all their policies around responding to calls where there's been an aggressive dog on a property oh, okay. and animal management. Um, like the ranger, I don't know what the equivalent might be in the States, but we'll go out and check on the abusive, or the, the pet who's causing harm, okay. or where there's been complaints from neighbours, and they then take the animal to the pound. And what they found in one particular case was that they, a woman said, you can't take my dog, my husband will kill me. And they took the dog, and the consequences were quite severe. Oh. So now what's happening in Victoria is, a whole bunch of councils are going, oh, that was completely preventable. What can we now do? So part of my job is to train them up on what they can do. So I guess my question is, do you have any experience in working with local government around um, policies? Yes, I think that um, that should never have happened because there should have been coordination up front in terms of reviewing scenarios that might arise and how do we handle those scenarios. Uh, especially in cases of intimate partner violence, that is very similar to cases where there might be child welfare endangered, and something is being done by child welfare agencies, and the woman says, you can't do that. If the take, kids are taken out of her house. If he even knows that you visited here, he'll, he's gonna beat me up. He may do something to the kids before you take them away. So uh, I think coordination needs to be done in advance, examining how do we handle this effectively so that the, uh, yes, the animals are taken if they need to be taken, but it's done in such a way that we don't endanger the human beings who are in that household. So uh, I don't know the specific ways of dealing with that, but it sounds to me like there wasn't enough thought given to all the possible scenarios that might arise. Child welfare should have been consulted. Intimate partner violence professionals should have been consulted. What happens if we implement this policy, uh, policy for your clients? What are the implications for your clients if we do this? And I'm sure that both child welfare and animal welfare would have said, that, you know, wait a minute, we, need to, we think how we're going to do this. Uh, we have to have these safeguards in place. So, for example, let's say that tomorrow uh, the Australian Veterinary Medical Association says uh, any suspected animal abuse must be reported, okay, mandatory reporting. AMRIC will have to close its doors. If they go into a community in the Northern Territory and they have to report every single instance where they suspect animals are being abused and neglected, that's the last time they will be in that community. And so in the long run, animal welfare is going to be in individual cases, yeah, maybe those animals might be protected, but they're never going to be invited back into any indigenous community. So, you know, mandated reporting sounds good in that regard, but again, if we don't think it through, we may be in trouble. Any, any other questions or comments? Okay. Mike, you had a question, yeah. didn't you? Before you left? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's been a there's been a program on um, the, the, the crime channel on Foxtel recently, which I recorded, and there were um, there were 13 cases. There was a, a, the program was called Born to Kill, um, and it basically looked at a variety of serial killers <coughs> in the states, but there were a couple from the UK as well, um, and. You know, was asking the question: Was it circumstances that that made these killer or killers? Often they worked in you know, duos. 
was it circumstances that drove them to it, or was it something in the genes that when they were born, they were always going to kill them? There was nothing. But I started watching it, and after the first three, every single one of these, these killers had a background in animal cruelty. And by the, by the end of the 13, it turned out that nine out of these serial killers, or nine of the duos out of the 13, that had a background, an early background when they were kids in animal cruelty. And I was just wondering if the, if the figures you've seen or, or, or come across or researched match those that just happened to come up in that particular program. Was what yeah, I yeah. Well, you know, that kind of situation is just a kind of just a little bit of a step above uh, anecdotal reports. And so the sample is so selective it's hard to make out what that really means. So for example, you might find that, uh, was it 13 you said total? Yeah. Uh, 12 of the 13 were meat eaters. And you go, oh, meat eating and serial killing. <laughs> uh, so there's that, that issue of just picking one characteristic out and looking at how often it occurs in that sample without comparing what it looks like in other samples. They're not a representative group, let's say. That's one of the main problems. Uh, there are cases, very clearly, where a, an individual who goes on to engage in serial homicides has perpetrated horrific animal abuse, and it sounds almost like they were practicing for what they would later do to human beings. Uh, you here in Australia had that uh, Martin in, in Tasmania, Martin. Right. Yes, and you know, his mother apparently made him abuse animals when he was a very young child, and then he went on to doing it on his own and enjoying it. Uh, so yes, we see that, but we have to be cautious. Uh, do you all remember Jeffrey Dahmer in the United States? He was a uh, serial killer, uh, male victims, and he would uh, keep their bodies and consume body parts later on, keep his fridge loaded with uh, you know, some livers and hearts and Things. Well, they ate lunch, they said. They said they ate lunch. Uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer, D-A-H-M-E-R. And uh, when he was a kid, he apparently would run around finding roadkill. And he'd bring it home, and he would, you know, dissect them and use acid to take the bones off of, the flesh off of the bones of the animals, he'd range the bones, and his father had given him some equipment to use to, to pursue that hobby, okay? He did that to his human victims. He would use acid. They found bats mm. at his home where he would use acid to dissolve the flesh. Well, I was giving a talk once in Wisconsin, and uh, a vet came up to me at the break, and she said, well, we were talking about Jeffrey Dahmer. I used to collect roadkill when I was a kid. <laughs> I, I was fascinated with bot, with uh, the structure of bodies and, and what mammals looked like inside. So whenever I found a raccoon or something else on the side of the road, I'd take it home and use my little dissection kit to take it apart. So you have the same behavior going down very, very different paths. In one case, that behavior led to healing, and in another case, led to horrible abuse of human beings. So this, you know, it's just difficult to predict. And especially when we look at, you know, fairly, thankfully, again, fairly low frequency individuals like serial killers, uh, it's very hard to study them, and it's very hard to know if what they're telling us is accurate. Because many of them would fit the bill of antisocial personality disorder. Not all, but many would, and it may be hard to, in fact, believe what they tell us. And you had a question. A good, a good question, yes. 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 I just wanted to make a comment on your comment with them saying they should you know, be encouraged maybe to report yes. in some way. But my husband's a vet, and he has always bemoaned the fact that they weren't taught mm -hmm. psychology. Because he says most of his clients come in, not because the animal is unhealthy, 
up, but because they need someone to talk to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so it is quite mm -hmm. right what you're saying. And you know, you said something that people don't quite think that they're somewhere in up to hearing the whole story. Yes. But if they come up in enough, you do get the whole story. Mm -hmm. And so veterinarians need to be helped really with to what to do. They yeah. need to be helped with what to do. Because yeah. they're not trained. Mm -hmm. They're not supposed to be social workers. No, and and really, he just said it should be included because yeah. in the curriculum, psychology, because you are dealing with the humans more than the actual mm -hmm. animals. It's the animals are easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's the humans that bring them in that are the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, there's one program, uh, the vet school at Fort Collins in Colorado in the United States, uh, has an extensive uh, collaboration with the social work department and uh, veterinarians in training do get training on the link between animal abuse and child maltreatment and domestic violence and uh, because it's mandated to report in Colorado we also receive extensive materials about the appropriate protocol to use for reporting they're provided with forms that say have you consulted the domestic violence agency have you consulted child welfare and uh, they try to avoid the problems that were described by you in terms of responding you know, in good faith, but winding up messing things up uh, inadvertently. Mm. We've got a couple of questions up the back here. I'm not sure if it's one or two questions, but... Yes. Yeah. Have they developed any um, behaviour change programs for people with autism animals? You know, I mentioned the program in Perth. Uh, one of the um, problems that has plagued this field is that uh, often individuals will implement programs, but they will not build in any way of evaluating the effectiveness of what they're doing. So there is a uh, fairly popular program in the United States called Anacare Child that is an evaluation and treatment uh, program for children, adolescents who have abused animals. Uh, I can't recommend it to you because there's been no evaluation of it. So we need to essentially have evidence-based interventions and in many instances it won't be a matter of treating animal abuse but it'll be a matter of treating the other problems that have led to acting out in that particular way. And did you have a question as well? Yeah. Uh, children that have seen the animal abuse, that now grow up, are they doing the same thing or are they, do you have any sort of evidence along those lines? I'm sorry, repeat the first part of it again. Children who've witnessed the abuse of animals and now grow up to be adults, have so we got any data on whether they are now doing trading with these animals? Well, I don't have the answer in adulthood, but I will have answers when we finish analyzing the data from our study, because we in fact are looking at that very thing. Uh, my, my speculation, and again, I can't, put, uh, I can't refer you to actual data on this, but my speculation is that um, individuals who are exposed to animal abuse in childhood, uh, yes, they may in fact be more likely to engage in animal abuse themselves, whether as older children or as adolescents or as adults, but there are also many individuals who are exposed to animal abuse uh, for whom that becomes the impetus for them to devote their lives to animal welfare. So, you know, again, it's a matter of uh, predicting why did that woman become a veterinarian and Jeffrey Dahmer became a killer? They were both fascinated by the same activity when they were children. Yeah, I was interested because there's been some fairly horrific examples where, given the time for, for instance, one boat took his wife and child down to the shed and then skinned the other in in front of him. And the message there to the child and to the woman was, this could be you. <laughs> so therefore I was thinking that it might be significant to find out how that actually affects the child later on in relation to their view of, of life and, you know, abuse of animals and that Yeah. Well, you know, the, the case that it brings to mind to me is, uh, and it doesn't relate specifically to animal abuse, but I think it, it, it relates to your question uh, more generally. Uh, in some instances, children who are exposed to animal abuse begin to take on that protector role. 
you know, they're, they're protective of uh, the animals. If there's intimate partner violence in the home, they may be protective of their moms. There are some cases where children are exposed to intimate partner violence, and they become more strongly attached to the perpetrator. Uh, I know of one instance where uh, the abuser was incarcerated, and when his children visited him at the prison, he would give his oldest son, who I think was 13 or 14, a list of the things he should enforce at home while dad was in prison. So uh, again, uh, I, I hate to generalize, uh, and I think we need to know more about the child's interpretation of what they're witnessing, uh, other support systems that the child may have in place in terms of other relatives, uh, someone they can confide in at school, uh, a minister they are confiding in, but it, it's just very difficult to say exposure per se helps you predict something in the future. There, there are some studies that have looked at the motivations for uh, animal abuse perpetrated by children, as well as animal abuse perpetrated by adults. Uh, for children, in some cases, it may be imitation of what they've seen at home. Uh, if uh, an abuser uh, at home is not only uh, beating his wife, but he's also uh, beating one of the animals or plucking feathers from the bird, as one of the moms described, uh, there are cases where children imitate that behavior. Uh, there are cases where gang initiation rites involve abuse of animals that has to be performed in order to become a member of the gang. There are cases where uh, children may in fact be practicing something they want to try with another child. And that may be true in the area of sexual uh, abuse of animals. So uh, again, yes, we, we need to identify the cases and describe the cases, but you're perfectly right. Until we understand the motivation, uh, you know, the why behind the cat and the infant looking at the fish, until we, we really understand the motivations, we're going to be hard pressed to intervene effectively. Because you don't want to just set up an operant conditioning program to, you know, reinforce non animal abusing behaviors uh, or, you know, differential reinforcement of other behaviors than abusing animals. It's complicated. It's not just a matter of what we reinforce. No, I didn't say you said that, but some people say, oh, let's just focus on the animal abuse. No. You need to know more about it. You can't just focus on that specific behavior. Well, thank you for your questions, and um, uh, thank you, Frank. Thank You're you very welcome. Oh. Thank, thank you so much.